Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of WCM Fireside Chats. My name is Brian Cyril here, as always, with Kara Brodigan from the Canadian Camping and RV Council. Mr. Ben Quiggle is apparently on vacation, lost somewhere at some kind of gas station near the Grand Canyon where he can't get Wi-Fi. He said he was going to be here. He promised us he was going to be here. We promoted that he was going to do this awesome discovery that I really just made up and didn't run by him, but I committed him to it, and so I thought he'd be here, and He's having all kinds of issues because he doesn't have a hot spot on his phone. I really just think he's on vacation and doesn't care to join us. He doesn't want to. <laughs> yeah, that's what I really legitimately think it is. Wow. Um, he just is too like shy to say or doesn't want to. I don't know. Anyway, so he's obviously he's watching. <laughs> if he's watching, he better be here. Like that's I feel like if his Internet's good enough to watch, it should be good enough to be here. But. Uh, as always, we are available on a podcast as well, uh, Spotify, Google, iTunes, all the places. Uh, if you are on Facebook watching us on Woodalls or the Canadian Camping RV Council or Insider Brooks or one of the pages, uh, you can comment and we will see that. We'll put you up here, have a nice little discussion today. Uh, if you're in one of the groups watching, you can comment, but we can't see it, uh, just so you're aware of that. So um, Mr. Ben Quiggle is obviously our news guy, editor of Woodalls, probably had a stack of things that we were going to talk about today. and. Now we have no idea where to take this news conversation, open discussion type thing. So, um, interesting. Riley is contributing on. this week. Yeah. Well, yeah. then my sink, Hi, like, my sink just started gurgling or something. I think there's like some kind of monster in it or something. I'm in like a hundred year old cabin. So, ghosts. Yeah. Uh, definitely has to be at least three or four of them. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it is that time of year where we're kicking off the camping season. We've already done it in a lot of places, March, spring break, those kinds of places. But I think really like some of the northern campgrounds, obviously up in Canada, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, places like that are really gearing up to start here April 1st, April 15th, that kind of thing. So tell us a little bit what's going on in, in Canada, Kara, while I frantically look at Woodall's trying to figure out what else to talk about. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, thanks. Uh, so I think uh, broadly, our members here are really focused right now on just on kind of spring opening, um, it, you know, trying to wrap their brains around what uh, recent restrictions and stuff look like as they prepare to open for the season. There's, I mean, some positive in terms of, you know, at this time last year, folks weren't open able to open at all in most places. Um, so there was, you know, some loss of revenue, obviously, and things like that. Um, we're still for sure being impacted by things like stay at home orders and stuff like that, um, in lots of areas of this country. So, um, what's going on in, what's going on in Ontario? I didn't mean to interrupt you, but just let, I mean, we're having no, a conversation, right? Now I thought of something we can talk about. Yay. So Ontario yeah. has this new stay at home order. How does it affect parks? Well, so, I mean, they've got a stay at home order for 28 days. Uh, it sounds like if you have a seasonal, um, lease agreement with a park then you are able to visit your seasonal lot um okay. so you know that's great for for our members who who operate a business that way um obviously you know those overnight campsites are impacted by this dynamic i'm sure um it's going to be difficult kind of april and into may um as as those short-term stay sites aren't able to be uh, rented. Yeah. 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 So, uh, that's unfortunate. I think, you know, they're seeing lots of numbers, uh, number increases specific to these variants and things like that. So, um, that's prompted this additional, uh, lockdown. I can't even remember how many in, uh, you know, I think it's the third round now, uh, Sotero, I could be wrong there for sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's impacting those shorter term stay parks. I think the seasonal, those of our members that are operating seasonal sites are, you know, still prepping to, to open in, in the coming, whether some of them have opened already April 1st, um, but they're, you know, doing whatever they can to make sure that their uh, properties and the, their businesses are operating really safely and keeping everyone distanced and, and following any sort of public health requirements, specifically in Ontario. Um, the dynamic is a little bit different in some of the other provinces right now. Um, here in Alberta specifically, you know, our parks are able to open. Our We saw, you know, our public parks sites, uh, websites, 
uh, get flooded with reservations the the kind of first couple of days that they uh, open for those. So I, you know, I think folks are getting out to camp wherever possible. I have members here in Alberta who are you know opening all of their facilities and and are able working closely with Alberta Health Services to make sure that they're following any um, guidelines specific to their, their business. So it really, really right now varies across the board, um, depending on your location, which has been the case for over a year now. Yeah, for over a year. So I think we're used to it. Like by all intents and purposes, everything we're seeing down here in the States or whatever, uh, is, is good. Like, uh, I mean, numbers are up. The, the people that we do, it's interesting Like the people that we do marketing for, right. They always want that year over year, month over month comparison. Yeah. So, We've almost got to go back two years to see what it's like. It's so it's so different. Um, yeah, you can never measure 2020 against. Right. Well, but especially now in the first three months of the year, because regardless of where you were, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, right now we're kind of coming out of it, right? In 2020, at the end of April was when we, everybody lifted their the lockdowns initially here. Right. Um, but when you're looking at year over year comparisons, how did March do against March? There's no way. And, it, oh. and you can't even go back to 2019 because now everybody wants to get outside, which is fantastic for us, but that's still yes. not an accurate year over year comparison. So everybody knows they're up, but we don't know how much. Are we doing good in marketing? I, I mean, there's people there, but is it my fault? I don't know, but. Yeah, no, I, I completely uh, imagine it really complicates your profession specifically. I think, um, you know, there's ju it's just this crazy anomaly. We're gonna look back at, you know, charts and data 10 years from now and see those big spikes. And, I, you know, I don't, I, I think there's so many factors contributing to, to how the industry is performing right now. Um, and, you know, you're right, we're in a good position compared to a lot of other industries. So it's tough to complain about, but it'd be lovely to have a, a good grasp of exactly what's causing these um, specific issues in certain areas, but it's, it's impossible, I think. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's clear. It's up almost everywhere. Like, I, I can't yeah. think of a client who's who's down. I mean, like, we can. It's very easy to prove that that marketing is working overall. It's just that right. year over year, like you're looking at, like, why am I up, or how much yeah. am I up, or you know, is this and how do I replicate year? this and continue this and, right. and make sure to be able to maintain this momentum, or at least not lose all of the momentum as we move into the future. So because right, that's not that's a huge unknown, right? Like obviously, there's there's all these new people who have bought our RVs, who continue to buy RVs, who are yep. enjoying the outdoors, who love this stuff. Uh, does that stick though? Like, I mean, obviously some of them will, if you've obviously bought 120,000 or $500,000 or whatever priced RV, you're committed for a little yeah. bit anyway. Um, okay. But if you're tenting or camping or discovering glamping for the first time, like, does that stick? And, and I feel like it will for a lot of people, but I also feel like it's case by case specific, depending on the area, your campground, what experience you're offering, how services you mm -hmm. provide, how you follow, like, the totally. same thing as it always is, right? Reviews. Yep. Uh, how you communicate, but mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. Well, and I think, you know, we, you and I have talked about this lots before, uh, specifically about how this whole, despite how terrible this kind of global scenario is, it's really motivated folks to kind of change things up and do unique, cool stuff that um, in a lot of cases really bettering their businesses and and improving the level of customer service and how they're interacting with their guests and all those things which you know will the appetite for those things remain after you know maybe things transition closer to normal again it's going to be interesting to watch how how this stuff impacts um all of all of us going forward for sure i think i think it's a huge opportunity and this is what we this is what we've told clients, right? Like you've got people coming into the outdoors, but are you going like, it's very easy to treat them like they expect to be treated and thus mm -hmm. convert them into long-term campers, right? Campers. It's yeah. basically people who like the outdoors, especially with cabins and glamping. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's very much going to be a case by case, person by person basis. But I think if enough people are doing the right things, which I feel like they are, um, mm -hmm. then it's it's very easy to, to, to open somebody's eyes long-term, especially as, as COVID and it means it's going to continue, right? When 
obviously vaccines are going to help us and all those kinds of things and numbers yeah. are going to hopefully keep continuing to go down as they are uh, in the states and all those kinds of things um yeah. but but it's here it's here to stay right. it's so here and so i think but what i'm saying is, is i think it's almost a good thing right the longer that covid sticks around in whatever form or fashion it is mm-hmm. obviously we don't want anybody to get sick we don't want anybody to die nobody's saying that but if you and, and obviously it's not easy to discount those things but if you put those aside for a second and just look at the fact that it's forced everybody outside and into the outdoors and those kinds of things yeah i think the longer that it sticks around the longer that behavior becomes more permanent for the consumer yeah well i couldn't agree more and i think it's almost given us this big kind of collective wake-up call where we were all just i feel this majorly in my own life where i was just kind of in this rat race like work, 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 get all the things done, drive all the kids to all the sports and the places. And we were overscheduled to the nines. And, you know, it was just this constant demanding pull. And suddenly I got this slap upside the head where I was like, you know, give your head a shake. There are more important things here in your life than all this crap that you're focusing or prioritizing. Um, And yeah, get outside, prioritize your mental health. Um, you know, have schedule free time with your kids and and go camp and do all of these things. I really think that's going to be a long term um, thing for a lot of people. They're going to hang on to that and remember that jolt and that wake up call uh, long into the future. At least I hope so. Well, we're seeing that some a little bit with our clients too. Like I you bet, know, and you and you you know you send a campground like yep. everybody feels like I think that they need to do everything all the time, everywhere for their business. Yep. And there's this hesitancy with businesses in general, but obviously I'm speaking from the fact that we work with so many campgrounds right. uh, specifically, but there's a there's a hesitancy to outsource, to trust anybody to do anything, to, to pay mm-hmm. the money that it costs versus you doing it yourself. Right. But I think that part of this shift, at least for us, has been there's been more people willing to open their eyes to some of the technology that Yes, we could do for them, but they can also do for themselves yep. that help them save some of that time to go outside mm-hmm. and be with their kids and their family and not spend as much time stressing over their business. And sure. I mean, it's always going to be there, right? It's always your business. I'm a business owner too. Mm-hmm. But if you can carve out more of that time for your family, for your friends to de-stress, I mean, it's better. And, and some of this technology is is crazy how awesome and efficient it can be. Yeah, absolutely. I do. I agree. I think it's one of the things that really has positively impact. It's been a positive uh, repercussion of of all of this. It's really forced a ton of change that we simply a lot of us wouldn't have, you know, chosen to, to make those changes tough and scary and if things are kind of mostly working, why bother changing them? Well, that's how change usually works, right? You got to be forced into it. So totally. Yeah. And I think I know, you know, speaking as a campground owner, I think I 100% was guilty of like, you know, my park was full reservations were coming in, you know, we had events and all these great things going on all the time. Like I didn't have this um, motivation to make changes because things were going well. You know, my business was thriving. We were in a great position. Think There wasn't uh, a, an underlying um, fire there to to change or edit things because status quo worked well for worked, everybody. Right. And so that's, yeah, that's what we've, and it's exacerbated right now because of the pandemic a little bit, but mm-hmm. that's yeah. what we've seen. And, and I'm just going to, I'm talking about marketing because I don't like, Quiggle's the news guy. Like I, so let's just help people with marketing a little bit, but yeah, um, yeah. I that's mean, what I know. I don't, I don't, you know, I read the Woodall's headlines, but I don't like absorb them like Quiggle does every day. So, um, but well, yeah, and it's, it's a free episode this week. We can talk about whatever we want, right? Well, that's true. I mean, but I think we're like, I posted on Facebook, we were going to talk about news, news, and then Quiggle's some kind of discovery thing that I made up. For. Yeah. I'm really disappointed he didn't show for this. I really wanted to hear about it. I know it's yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry, yeah, I, cut you off. I even prepared a little video of that I was gonna little poke fun at him and his discoveries and stuff. So maybe we'll play that later anyway. If he's not I feel like that. we really should, yeah. Um, but so yeah, from a marketing standpoint, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, embracing. I'm sorry, yeah, embracing change. How you know the status oh, yes, quo? Change. 
Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there's but that's been historically the the one of the issues that we've chall- had challenge with marketing, like trying to push people toward new technologies and embrace things, is because you've seen when I mean, you go back all the way back to the sixties, fifties, sixties, when you know franchise camping was first starting out and stuff like that. Right. Um, and you've got the you've got billboards through all the all those years. You've got magazine ads. You've got print ads and rat cards and and these things yeah. historically have worked and they still do work to a certain extent, um, but people don't realize the opportunity on the other end. Like if I do more then I can increase by X percentage because the people who drive by their park who are Googling because they're not on Google or looking on Facebook because they don't post on social or whatever, right? Yeah. Or clicking their competitor's ad because they're not on Google. Mm-hmm. They're not waving or calling the park and be like, hey, I'm going down the street to your competitor. So you don't really know what you're missing. Yeah, yeah. Which is okay. Like you can be happy with flat or up 3%. Like there's nothing wrong with that. But mm-hmm. a lot of people don't realize what the potential is. Yeah, it's, it, there's so many metrics that are almost impossible to measure. Um, and, and I think, you know, I was talking with some campground owners, campground owners specifically about this stuff last week because, you know, I think there's often this appetite to kind of hang on to the way things have been done because they worked. But a lot of times they miss the the, the concept that our consumers – are changing the way that they want to absorb information. Consumers don't want to seek out a campground guide necessarily, or um, pay attention to a billboard on a highway as, as they would have in the past. Like th- the way consumers are, uh, are receiving information is changing. And the way they want to, you know, things like um, having your website really mobile responsive and, and things like that. I mean, the majority of our our guests are searching for properties on a mobile device. And if your website doesn't load properly on a mobile device, I mean, I don't know. I, personally, I'm going to, like, I can't click the button. <laughs> I, it's, I'm not going there. I'm going to call the campground whose phone button works, right? Um, so anyways, I'm, I, I think often we see campgrounds, like I said, kind of in that status quo because it's worked all this time and why fix what ain't broke kind of thing. But I agree this diversification, this ability to really um, pay attention to what your consumers want from you and not just, you know, your same old regulars all the time who already know about you. But like you said, embrace or accessing portions of the market that you never would have otherwise. Um, and, and I think too, using those, the tools that you talk about all the time, Google and Facebook and all of those things provide this unique ability to, you know, in the old days, my campground even, we used to pay to have brochures printed and would distribute them in the, in, in the province of Alberta, you know, in the mail or whatever, like in the old, old, good old days. Um, but again, you have, you get no analytics or, or ability to measure the performance of that investment, the way that you can with, you know, these amazing tools that are available to your businesses now. And I think that's incredibly valuable to be able to pay attention to, you know, how many eyeballs are converting to bookings and all of those things. That's worth the investment, the advertising investment, in my opinion, alone. Well, that's the easiest way I found to explain it. Like I, we used to teach classes on this back when the world was normal and we were all in person. Um, right. But I, but one of the things I would frequently pull out of my toolbox or the, the easiest way I had to explain to people is it's all about attention. Everything mm-hmm. is about attention. And right. so it's not that billboards don't work anymore. It's not that magazine articles don't work or radio or TV or rat cards in the rest areas or whatever. Like these things still are being picked up. They're just not being picked up and seen as much as yeah. they used to. And so now you've got this mm-hmm. ability and you've had it for 10 plus years with Google Analytics and stuff like that. But you, as we continue mm-hmm. to evolve some of this technology, you've got the ability to see how much attention am I getting for what I'm spending. Even on a billboard, you Absolutely. can put a call tracking phone number up there. Even in a magazine ad, if you still want to do that, you can put a call tracking number there. How many phone calls did I get? Sure. This brochure mm-hmm. that's sitting in a rat card that, I mean, you can spin up, you can get as, as intricate and detailed as you want, right? Like here's the phone number sure. that I'm only going to use for the rest stop off of this highway on this place. Okay, and so yeah. I'm going to know, do I drive 20 miles out of my way to put it in this rest area or just the other rest area? Mm-hmm. 
So you can really get granular and specific in some of this stuff. And, and, and what it ends up being, at least in my mind, is, is I want to, all of us have a limited budget, right? Nobody's got unlimited yes. money. Because if you did, no. you're buying a Super Bowl ad. Yeah. Um, but, or what is it, hockey up, up in Canada? Come on, we watched the Super, Super Bowl, Bowl too. Hockey? Is there a Super Bowl of hockey? Or? <laughs> the Stanley Cup. <laughs> all right. Is that, I mean, I don't know if there's any, yeah, it's the Stanley Cup. Okay. So, yeah, really okay. Cup. But we also, us Canadians watch the Super Bowl, okay? Half of us watch it just for well, the app. I know, all right, I know. I'm not saying you don't. I'm just wondering if there's not another market opportunity in addition to the Super Bowl. But, yeah, the Grey Cup. Um, we have, yeah. you know, we've got some things. Buy, buy an ad right. if you have unlimited dollars. <laughs> yeah, but but most of us don't. And so that's the point no. is you need to, as a small business owner, wherever you are, campground, lawyer, accountants, whoever you are, you need to be uh, purchasing the most attention that you can for the least amount of dollars possible. And so sure. that billboard could be anywhere from 300 bucks a month to, you know, I've seen billboards $5,000 a month in the yep. US, depending on where, where what area is. you're in. Yeah. How many people drive past it? But ninety-five percent of those people who drive past it don't even don't care about camping. Yeah, um, they don't. They're not interested. And if they are interested in camping or they like the outdoors, they're probably not looking to stay that night. And so, what is your return on investment for that billboard? If it's three hundred dollars a month, sure, do it. I mean, it's right. Yeah. But same thing with all of your other marketing. And, and if you can reach ten thousand people on Facebook a day who you know for certain like camping because Facebook's super creepy and stalks everybody and knows that stuff. Um, why wouldn't you want to reach those 10,000 people versus maybe you're going to reach five who are looking to stay and go camping a day? Maybe. And, Whatever. and, and you have no idea how to track those five. Like maybe you'll reach five, maybe you'll reach a hundred, but who, who knows? <laughs> We've got okay. Darlene Oswald here from the BC uh, Campground and Lodging Owners Association. Is that BC right? Lodg BC Lodging and Campgrounds Association. Yeah. Oh, so uh, I just put owners in there, but it's full of owners yeah. anyway. I feel like it's, it's the same. I mean, so, yeah, sure. Yeah, I changed your name, Darlene. I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. She says there's still a lot of campgrounds that don't have a web presence. I've seen members with members have 300 check-ins. Uh, never takes never taken the time to have a website, like you said. Brian, they're so old school and think the Brett cards are the only thing that and it hides, hides the rest of it. But let's see. Uh, are the only thing that they need. Yeah. Yeah. Which I mean, again, I was guilty of that too in, in my early days where yeah. like the park was full and what were your early days. What year are we talking about here? My early days? Uh yeah. two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Oh, Those were my old. early days. That's so I long know. ago. I know. Listen, you don't have to tell me. Um, but in those early days, we had kind of um, taken over this business that, you know, didn't have a computer in the office yet and, and things like that. So certainly weren't um, utilizing the, the tools. I mean, I mean, oh, seven, oh, eight, oh, nine. I mean, Facebook was brand new and we all just used it to post what we did that day. <laughs> um so these kinds of tools and things didn't specifically exist then, but um, it, it it was a an interesting and fast, you know, five years that transitioned to suddenly having a ton of different tools at your fingertips, right? And and I think, you know, maybe because I was so fresh at it at that time, I was a bit more receptive to that change. But um, it, I mean, it's daunting, and and you know not we don't all know about how google ads work and how facebook no. works and whatever else that's why we need insider perks and you know i think it's it's telling which campgrounds are capable or are or more receptive to that change because of you know them reaching out to companies like yours to partner with and and utilize the services that you guys offer and take that off off their plates right it's certainly, I'm sure, certainly worth, worth um, the investment. Well, I mean, even if you do it yourself, right? I mean, there's some things like I would never tell a campground owner unless they had a marketing background to do Google ads themselves because it's like for even for an agency, like it's one of the most complicated things that we do. Like every yeah. single morning, I'm in all of our clients making tweaks to Google ads. And mm -hmm. I know agencies who charge retainers in LA of $50,000 a year who, who actually work with campgrounds. 
um, mm -hmm. who set up Google Ads campaigns and don't touch them for maybe a year. Months, months. Yeah, or a year <laughs> or longer, right? I mean, yeah. there's not the LA agency, but yeah, there's lots right. of people who set it up once, even even park owners. Mm -hmm. um, and they just, they don't have any idea how it's working or what it's doing or whether it's paying off, but somebody told them to run Google Ads and so they're doing it. But yeah. in most cases, you're probably wasting money if you don't know what you're doing. And the, and the fascinating thing is to me, it's like I understand if I'm coming to you and you don't know me or somebody else is and saying, well, you got to do Google Ads, right? Right. Um, prove it to me. Well, mm -hmm. but I can't. And then when I show you some people the data, they still are very, very hesitant and don't want to do anything. Like we've got a campground in the States down here that I was just looking at their numbers last week. We had a conference call with them. That's a, it's a big Jellystone park. Yeah. Uh, and, and they've got a large budget on Google ads, but I think I want to say in the last seven days, they spent maybe $1,800 on Google ads, oh. which mm -hmm. is a lot of money, right? Yeah. Okay. But Absolutely. it took me probably four years to get them to that point where they would trust me enough with a budget like that because 40 40 wait four four oh i was like wow oh. i'm a young professional pre, okay? yeah i was gonna say pre, i'm not one of those old people who are at work in 2008 i'm a young person so. right so yeah. um how nice for you yeah uh so then what was this oh so no we can prove that we can prove the numbers four right years. so like you're, you're, like I can show this park, this Jellystone, through a combination of they use Camp Spot, right? But it works with other software too. Mm -hmm. uh, through the reservations that are being taken from Camp Spot, because I can actually, like, when you make a reservation on Camp Spot online, right. Camp Spot and the code underneath will feed, mm -hmm. like, will allow me to see, or analytics or Google Analytics to see how much money that person spent, what site type they reserved, who nice. they are, all those kinds of things, and then I can take that. And pull it into a report for you. And obviously, mm -hmm. CampSpot can do that too, but I can show you from a marketing standpoint. Right. Um, so, who came from Google free search and how much did they spend in the last seven days? Yeah. I can show you that from Yelp, from Facebook, from Good Sam, from all the places, from my blurry camera that keeps automatically focusing on me. <laughs> um, and so, what I'm saying is, is like you look at this park like that spent $1,800 on Google Ads, it sounds crazy, except I can directly translate. In the last seven days, they spent eighteen hundred dollars. I can directly translate forty nine thousand dollars in revenue. Insane. That those Google ads. Yeah, that's yeah. like a twenty five. Like for every dollar you're spending, you're getting I don't know what twenty five dollars back. And I can uh, show you that. Like I can prove it to you, and and you still won't let me spend the money. Right. Yeah. It's 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 interesting because we campground owners often have a tough time. I shouldn't speak for all of us. I, I can relate to this feeling like I'm, I have my best interests at, at heart. You know, I'm going to make the best choices for myself. So I'm going to kind of hang on to the, the reins pretty tight. Um, that was my experience. I think certainly uh, for several years, I, I, my my perception of that stuff did change and shift over time. But um, I mean, that stuff is incredibly valuable. There's no way to to translate, you know, a rack card analytics to to that kind of measurement. I mean, you you couldn't. There's no way to tell. I mean, no, it blows my mind. And I understand why campground owners are hesitant, right? Because there's a lot of sure marketing people or the kid down the street who says they can do something or whatever that have told them and promised them the sun, the moon, the stars, and they can't deliver. And so this is part of the reason like we try to educate campground owners, right? Like I'm on shows like this. I'm doing videos on Facebook. I've got all kinds of things on websites. Like I'll have an hour long phone call with somebody who's not a client and never talks right. to me again yeah. because I want, and we do it for our clients too, because I want to educate them. I want them to understand, like you don't need to know how to do Google ads. You don't need to know how to be an expert right. at social or uh, do things with voice search that I know how to do. Like, mm -hmm. you can, but what I want you to do is be dangerous enough with that stuff yep. that when somebody like me tries to sell you on something or tell you they can do something, you know what questions to ask to determine if they're full of shit. Sure. Can we say shit? Yep. Is this a censored show? Is that allowed? I feel like you just um, did. So I did. So. <laughs> we'll see if we get a note from the FCC later or something like that. Yeah, know. we'll see. Time will tell. Um, yeah, no, I think... You know, the, there's these are incredibly valuable business tools that 
you know, frankly, we just don't all have the the kind of knowledge required to operate them in those ideal um, ways that really provide great um, business tools. You know, you can use so much of that data to make future decisions and strategize and it's incredibly valuable. I Ryan's asking, do you ever find campground owners that still heavily rely on print only? So I will say, um, like I mentioned, the campground that, um, that I owned when, when we took over from my ex-husband's family, there was no computer. We took every reservation with pen and paper, yeah. actually pencil, pencil, and a, like a ledger book and used a lot of erasers. Um, and the majority of the, the reservations, I mean, the phone rang off the hook all the time. Um, are they, they did have a, an established website at that time, but otherwise, you know, we're really relying on things like the printed Alberta campground guide, um, any sort of rat card distribution that we did ourselves um, for kind of word of mouth. And also, you know, frankly, the park had been open for 25 years already. So there's this foundation of established reputation and, you know, return customers and things like that, that obviously keep a business like that really going after so many years of kind of successful operations and things like that. But um, it's, it's really interesting to see, to come across parks now that, so that's a long way of saying, I think a lot of parks have transitioned to doing things more technologically advanced, but there certainly still are those parks that um, really rely on kind of the, their old fashioned, I hate calling it that. I don't, I think, you know, they, like I said before, they're doing things because it works for them. And right. and, and when Which you talk nothing about, wrong with, like if you're happy right. with that, great. Well, but then, but, but what I don't want, like what I don't want is for somebody to call me on the phone and complain that they were only up 2% when they don't right. have online booking and they don't have a mobile responsive website and they're not on mm -hmm. Google and they never touch yeah. Facebook because of whatever. That's what yeah. I don't want. Like if you're happy, cool. Great. Like yeah. no judgment, like do whatever sure. you want to do and relax and live your life and be up 2% every year. And like, yeah, congratulations. But, but if you're going to complain, be willing to do something about it. Yeah. Well, and I think oftentimes when you talk to business owners that are choosing to operate in that way, they kind of say like our, our customer base values that about us. Um, <clears throat> and so well, I sure. think and some of your customers do some. Yeah. I think it's important to, to to cater to those individuals who would prioritize spending their dollars in a park that maybe doesn't you know have as technologically advanced processes and things like that but i do think it's really really important to pay attention to the way the market is changing and how trends are going and you know what your potential future customers are going to look like and um i don't think it's a one or the other either right no, like, I think I there's no, like it's it's a lot of black and white between owners who are like well i still want to have this personal service well you can do that with technology like you sure. can have both of the things you can still talk to people on the phone you can mm -hmm. like if you put live chat on your website like you can still be personal with people you can talk to them you can vet them you can give them great customer service it's not a one mm -hmm. or the other it's a yeah. why would you appeal to the whole market instead of just totally. going on the nostalgia so. I was I was talking to a campground owner the other day who texts her guests kind of during their stay mm -hmm. before they check in and and her guests often think that that's that stuff is automated but she is her she has she and her staff are kind of they pay attention to you know specifics about each guest they really personalize it where they can I think it's that's a great example of you know utilizing Utilizing something really efficient to establish this cool connection with with guests who are kind of like wow you know you maybe are connecting in a disconnected way but you know still you uh, it really demonstrates that she really cares about her guests and what yeah their it's the thought like it's customer park. service like that'll blow people away they'll leave a great review about it yeah absolutely yeah it's like yeah. you go to the hotel and you get the phone call like right after you walk in the room you're like oh do they have a camera and they see i just walked in here <laughs> they're like hey how's your room i mean it's impressive that they, sure, they yeah. you know because you're just used to a lot of businesses not 
caring or you are you not thinking that they cared i should say well and i think it's that's not even a conscious thing almost i think we just all kind of go about our day-to-day -day functions and i know in my case like i don't think i'm really that important so <laughs> like call me and ask me how my room is and i'm kind of like wow that's really sweet right that'd and I, so I think yeah those those small little touches are are easy ways to both use the technology but um kind of just personalize it quite a bit which is so valuable um ryan saying i agree with you 100 percent. if a website or mobile version gives me trouble i jump off and move on to the next company or business i hate that i think that way but it's just all about how long and how many steps you take the customer on so that's me too i really again that's a subconscious thing for me where i um you know i'll jump off of a, a reservation website even for a hotel if if I can't easily find buttons and book a thing right now or pretty quickly. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm not even going to go down that the rabbit hole and I leave. And, and I've caught myself afterwards being like, wow, I probably could have given that business more of a, more chance. Of a chance. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I think that's just indicative of kind of how much time we spend on these electronic devices and how much time we are willing to give to like, something taking our attention before we shift off to to something we feel is kind of more efficient or whatever um joe from pathfinder camp resorts here three locations in canada appreciate the great discussion thank you thanks for watching joe he's gonna sign off hope to catch the rest later yeah please watch uh the recording on facebook or uh check us out on all the podcast places <laughs> yeah, it's on YouTube too, I think. We got to get it oh, on yeah. the Canadian camping and RV council. We really do. I have that on my to-do list and keep skipping over it. So uh, we should sort that out ASAP. Um, but, All right, so, uh, let's, so let's let's do this. Uh, are you going to finish a thought before I change gears for a second? No, don't think so. Okay. Couldn't have been that important. <laughs> well, I just made you forget whatever it was. So. It's all um, good. So here, let's do this. Let's let's give people. We're gonna we're gonna talk. We're gonna we're gonna poke fun a little bit at Quiggle because he's not here for a second. Right. On. Uh, and then after that, as a teaser, we'll come back and what we'll do is we'll go through the things that you should have on your list for marketing wise to prep for your park that you can do yourself without hiring yeah. me or anybody else. Cool. And then we'll talk about some of the geeky things that I've been doing recently for clients so you can kind of see what's possible. Not that only I can do, but you could do too if you research it and read about you because I will never sell myself. Um, so. Let's do that. Does that sound like a plan? Yeah, I love it. Talk about like what you thought about from a campground owner's perspective. And Please. All that kind of stuff? Yeah. All right. So uh, we put in the comments uh, for many of you who have seen this about Mr. Quiggle. Uh, I committed him to like this. He was in the Grand Canyon, went on vacation. He drove all the way from Michigan. He lives in Michigan. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Like he's not here to defend himself. So it right. may we can say whatever be, we want. <laughs> yeah, it might be the first time that he's ever been outside Michigan. He may not have even known there was the United States of America outside the border I, of Michigan and Indiana. He did live in Indiana. So could I do time. know that it is his first time at the Grand Canyon. First time at the Grand Canyon? Okay. Yeah. All right. So I feel like he probably he, he thought that the Grand Canyon existed. But maybe it was a mythical place before he got there. Uh, and, he, and he didn't. So I don't know. Anyway, so he, he went all the way to the Grand Canyon. I think he was touring some of the Rocky Mountain areas on the West Coast, those kinds of places with his family. I was looking at, uh, I didn't look at his pictures, but I saw a couple of his posts on Facebook. Um, and so it looks like he's having a good time. But one of the one of the reasons I posted kind of like a teaser in the Facebook, or I can't remember what I said. What did I say? He discovered like a secret Egyptian tomb yeah, in the Grand Egyptian Canyon tomb. or something like that, right? Yeah. Which. So I just made, Wow. Which is cool, right? Like I thought, I mean, that would be cool for him to share. Like I thought it was a legitimate thing because he said he went hiking down in the Grand Canyon and he saw all kinds of cool things. So obviously, when you hear anybody say I discovered cool things, you immediately think they discovered an Egyptian secret tomb. Egyptian tomb. Yeah, yes, first thought. Yeah. So I I assumed that's what we were going to get to hear about. Um, and okay. but he's not here, and he said he's on vacation. And so uh, what I have done though is. Uh, there was a, oh there was a comment right I think it was in the RV Young, RV Young professional group somebody commented and said I was in the Grand Canyon a few years ago or something and I didn't see an Egyptian tomb and so they were questioning shocking logic. so I <laughs> I'm actually shocked. Out, I know so I've actually gone out and I've got this is not from the Grand Canyon this is from from one of Quiggle's other adventures because uh, he's actually if you don't know Quiggle is an archaeologist he, he's kind of like a modern day Indiana Jones. 
Wow. Uh, he only does wood hauls on the side. So, um, and again, he's, not here, to, just he's not here to just He's too amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a fantastic guy, like all kinds of skills. So yeah. I've unearthed this video of why, and this is kind of an answer to this guy's comment, why he didn't see it in the Grand Canyon too. Because uh, Quiggle works the same way. He's got the same kind of operational methods everywhere he goes. Uh, and so this video is, is just really quick. It explains to you why you will never find what Quiggle actually found. So we'll watch this and then we'll come back with a little bit of marketing stuff. Can't wait. All right, so I think that explains that, a lot. Right, so this is what I feel like probably basically happened in the Grand Canyon. Quiggle made okay. this amazing discovery of an Egyptian tomb that there was some kind of either remote or contraption or hidden door, and it just it's disappeared now. It's gone forever again. Uh, yeah, well, that's a real shame. I mean. I mean, a lot of historical things that are, are waiting to be discovered that only Ben Quiggle has seen uh, across the world, which is why it's so valuable. It's why he's on the show, why we have his regular commentary. Like, he has so much insight and so much value uh, to bring to the world, right? I mean, imagine, like, I mean, we could solve this, like, longevity thing, right? We could live to be 200, 300 years old if science advances enough, right? Uh, oh, okay. Whatever, whatever. Like, I'm going to live 300 years as long as I can be healthy. Anyway, imagine like Quiggle as an archaeologist living three, four hundred years and uncovering like historic campsites, like the first KOA or something like that, like digging his little brush in Billings. It'd be interesting. So, would it be? <laughs> Probably not. But I'm trying to give Quiggle. I'm trying to give Quiggle props here. Okay, he's not here to defend himself. We're trying to talk about all that kind of stuff. All right. Anyway, let's move on. This is like about marketing. Uh, so. And he really should have been here to see this stuff. But anyway, um, yeah. 
So if you're a campground, it's April. Um, well, really any time of the year, right? There are a couple things that you need to to be doing to make sure that you're set up in the most appropriate way to obviously serve the guests that you already have, uh, but yeah. the guests who are looking online and involved, especially these new guests, right, with COVID and stuff like that. So, and Absolutely. maybe I'm going to miss something. We'll, we'll talk about it. You can jump in, Kara, and tell me all, all those kinds of things. Uh, okay. So obviously, you're, in my mind, number one is your Google presence, right? Because this is where people are searching, yep. they're finding, like, whatever website they're going to. If they're going to Rover Pass or Good Sam or Woodalls or however yeah. they're finding your campground, uh, you can go to business google.com so business.google.com it's free and if you have not claimed your google listing which is where your map marker is located and all those kinds of things uh, your address and, and that kind of stuff um, you can do that for free they'll probably mail you a postcard to your campground or in some cases you can just do it very quickly with a phone call verification mm -hmm. and then you have a lot of control over that listing now it's that like when you google your own campground uh, if you see that box pop up on the right hand side that says the name of your campground and your has your photos and your address and driving directions and all those kinds of things underneath it your reviews reviews yep. yeah um this is this is what you can control by taking that one little step that's completely free uh, mm -hmm. and then you have a dashboard that you can log into where you can upload photos that you've taken to make sure you have your best side where you can answer those reviews where you can make sure your map marker and driving directions and all kinds of things are correct and yeah. And people are often surprised by, like, we deal with campgrounds in northern Michigan who are in the middle of nowhere who get, even in the off-season, 2,000-plus people looking at their Google My Business listing. Yeah. Uh, and you can oh, see that. And so the amount of people whose eyeballs are on this, like, if you're mm -hmm. not controlling in some facet uh, how people are perceiving your park, yeah. maybe they're still coming, but there's probably people that you could get in addition to the people who are already coming. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and it shocks me actually how sometimes Google's information is really inaccurate. Inaccurate. I I remember, again, aging myself, I don't know, 2009, 2010, wow. in a back and forth Thank battle you. with, right, with, uh, with Google to replace my, uh, or, or repair my pin that was, you know, directing my customers to a place far from where my park actually was um so and that and that was a battle so it's great that you have that ability now to claim the listing and really control those things it gives you a ton of um autonomy i think which is really valuable yeah so so that obviously google's super popular like we'll just stick on listings for a second right um you can do the same thing on bing people forget about bing uh, it's yeah, definitely sure not do. as widely used as as Google is, but there's still like the last data I saw on it was like somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of people actually use Bing, and yeah. that and that audience actually tends to skew toward a higher income, older demographic, which is interesting. Which is basically what campground owners want for the most part. Yep. Um, so you can go on, and I don't know the UR, the link off the top of my head, but you can Google it. It's same thing. It's like it's called Bing Places, and you can claim your listing. Do the same thing with a postcard or phone number verification or whatever. I'm and curious. Can, wait, do they have an explanation for why why the demographic? I think when I originally read it, and I can't remember, wasn't there a point in time where Apple had Bing as a default search on their phone? You're asking the wrong girl. I don't know. I think I think there was at some point, but anyway, okay. I, I, yeah, I I haven't read too deep into the explanation why, and maybe that's changed. I haven't looked at it for a couple right. of years. Okay. Um, but either way, it's anyway, people. Sorry. Yeah, so it absolutely. Takes, More eyes. Yeah. To claim it, it takes 10 minutes, maybe a little bit longer if you're, obviously, if you have to wait on a postcard or something like that. But then you can just right. go and upload photos. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's all free. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, and you can have a presence there. The other one mm -hmm. is Apple Maps. Yeah. Very few people realize this, but I think it's mapsconnect.apple.com. Uh, free, too. You can control how you appear on Apple Maps across millions and millions and millions of iPhones and yeah. iPads and Macs all across the world. Uh, and you can do the very same thing. You just verify your business. And there's not quite as many controls over uh, Apple as there is on Google, but you can upload sure. a couple photos and you can put your make sure your information and your map marker is correct. Nice. This is used by a lot of people. Like I remember when we when I was starting my company, we were traveling around 2010 to 14, something like that. Like frequently, decades ago, like yeah, decades. 
no, this is this is this this is young. Do that like this. We're talking about the double digits, the 10, 11, right, not right. the eights and nines, Gara. Come on now. Um, but uh, yeah, we're like we would we would look on Apple Maps and even just local businesses who you would think like restaurants and stuff that just they weren't accurate. Like would take us to the wrong place or take us down the wrong road or whatever. And, and we were traveling to campgrounds at the time, um, but it wasn't just campgrounds. Right. So it's important to like you just don't want a frustrated guest who who no. arrives to your park pissed because they spent like twenty minutes trying to figure out the maps and the route around. Then they're already angry at you. Then they're looking yeah. for all the things that are wrong with your park that they wouldn't have otherwise looked at if they arrived with a smile on. Absolutely, so, yeah. So those Couldn't are probably the three. Those are probably the three big ones for listing wise. I mean, obviously, and then and then you talk about social media, right? You want to have your Facebook page set up so many people still like you like if you think that you don't have a facebook page you're wrong you don't need to create one for your business facebook nope. will create it for you for you and they will let people leave reviews and they will let people leave comments and things mm -hmm. are being said about you that yeah. you don't know so you right. can stick your foot in the ground and say i don't like social media and i'm not going to be on it for whatever reason but you're still on it so um you might as well control it. Like you don't have to play the game. It's okay. Like you don't have to be on Facebook, like either hire somebody to do it or mm -hmm. um, I mean, at least clean it up and then ignore it. Right. But at least make sure the proper address is there and your phone number and driving directions, mm -hmm. and some photos of your park. Absolutely so agree. Because it, like, I don't, I feel like nobody should argue with me that people are using Facebook to do research and things that relate to camping. <laughs> um, a little bit <laughs> so like you know again it's it's free it doesn't cost you anything but your time a little bit of time mm -hmm. um but there's really no like it's okay to have principles nobody's saying that like i don't I, if it wasn't for my business i probably wouldn't be on facebook at all right yeah i don't really post on my personal profile ever so mm -hmm. uh, yeah a couple times here and there i share stuff but that's it um yeah. I, think I, I think i went like seven years without posting from 2010 to whatever so that's awesome uh, yeah. wow um sorry, dog. so okay uh so facebook social media instagram obviously is your secondary option past that um we're just going by facebook kind of the same thing make sure you have an instagram created and then that's really like that's all you need honestly like if you want to get into more of social media or take a more advanced strategy then you can do things like depending on your audience, Snapchat and TikTok and Pinterest and Twitter and whatever else. But really, for most campgrounds, <laughs> the basics are Facebook and Instagram. And Instagram, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a great way to like visually showcase your park, provide, like you said, really uh, accurate, specific information about your park, contact information, all those things. And then, yeah, they. Do, I mean, it's just sits there if, if you don't want to right, that's it like at least put go on instagram log in post five photos in the same five minutes yeah and then at least like even if you look like you're not active on social at least there's a way for people to find you and look at like the five most beautiful photos that you ever thought were taken of your campground and mm -hmm. be amazed and they'll even if they're not booking right away then they're looking you maybe they're looking for your website or your google listing or something else that's happening and going on yeah, uh, making a booking or giving you a call or whatever you put your phone number in it's another right right absolutely ways for people to find you these uh, are free and easy ways to add exposure diversity to your business plan yeah. so website then uh obviously we didn't talk about your website but most people have websites which is why i didn't start off with that right so uh we've talked about you talked about making it mobile responsive and all those kinds of things um it's not about mobile friendly. Like you remember when we used to have the M dot websites yeah. that were totally separate and totally different. It's not that anymore. No. Like you need to have, and, and I haven't really seen a campground that has an M dot in years. No. But responsive simply means like it stretches and grows to whatever screen you're on. So when people say responsive, they usually think mobile. But if you do a responsive website right, it'll stretch to your 60 inch television in your room. Exactly. Or a billboard in Times Square or wherever, right? It'll mm -hmm. it'll just stretch and shrink and adapt uh, yeah. to whatever's coming. And so by having a responsive website, you're ready for almost anything that comes screen size wise. Uh, it's so valuable. People are consuming their stuff in so many different ways now. It's it's incredibly valuable. 
I mean, just, just to be available and to, to, again, not to have somebody struggle with you to be able to click the call to do whatever, mm -hmm. uh, just to have that responsive website. And, and you got to make sure, like, here's one of the biggest misconceptions we have. Like, you can design a pretty website. Like, sure, it's very easy. Like, yep. right, yep. you can hire a kid down the street who just got out of college for 250 bucks and they can design you a pretty website. Yep. The problem is, is that most people think that's all that needs done. Uh, when that the pretty website design is literally only consumer facing. Right. And 75% of the success on the internet is really how Google interprets it, how fast your website loads, what your SEO looks like, where you rank, all the things that are in the background that geeks like me do. Right. Uh, and you can learn these things too. Of course you can. All of, all of the things that I do can be done for free. It's just time is money, right? Yeah. Well, most of the things can be free, but... Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, just like Google Ads, obviously, is going to charge you, right? So Sure, um, yeah. But, like, knowing that these things exist and, 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 and being in control of them, like, just, if it, it takes 10 seconds to read, like, the top 10 things you should be paying attention to on your website. Just Google it. I don't even know what's going to come up, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be an article that talks about making sure it's pretty, of course, mm -hmm. making sure it's responsive, responsive. Uh, making sure it loads fast, mm -hmm. okay? Which yep. means two things. You have to pay for your website to be hosted somewhere that's more than $5 a month. Yes. Yes. Sorry. You've just got to Sorry. spend money. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then you have to have a website developer who actually knows how to not load like a 10 megabyte image on your homepage that they haven't actually optimized for the web. Right. But, you know, because you've all been on those websites, right? Where you load a website and you'll see like the top of the image and then. Bloop, yeah. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Like, oh, one step. Come on, let's go. <laughs> but you sit yeah. there and wait. Well, right. most people will just leave. Uh, but so it impacts. And people don't wait. No. And so uh, it impacts the customer staying on your website, making a reservation, but it also impacts what Google sees and how they rank you because Google very much wants fast websites because yep. Google wants people happy with Google search results. Yeah, Google's right. in it for Google. Yeah. The faster your website is, the higher they rank it because they know the user is going to have a good experience on your website, mm -hmm. which is a win-win for everybody, you and Google and the consumer. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So Google is very much focused on user experience and speed <laughs> is one of those things, but it's the easiest low-hanging fruit to do. Um, and then, you know, what would you want on a website? Like, I mean, we, we deal with, we have hedge funds we work with who want pop-ups as soon as somebody loads, loads on the website, and I have to talk them out of it. Like, if you were using a website, would you want to load a website and be like, oh, that's a beautiful pop-up right in front of you. Like, I can't see anything. What am I doing? What am I looking at? I don't care if you're offering me a 10% coupon. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see the beautiful image I was looking at. I wanted to figure out where I'm going or look at your menu or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, pop-ups can feel um, very kind of salesy, which I think a lot of people get um, turned off by. Um, and, it, and it's not to say that there's not a place for them. Like you can have a, a banner that comes in on the bottom or something that floats sure. up on the right hand side or, or yep. like all Strategy. kinds of different things, but, but popping up something right in front of your face, it's not something that you would want. So why would you want to put it in front of your guests? Uh, that, and that principle should apply to everything that you're, you're doing on your website. Ease of mm, navigation, totally. what pages are viewed, how, what information you're providing, all those kinds. Of, if you were going camping, what information would you want? Put that in your website. Yeah, well, and that's sometimes I'll speak as a campground owner again. Sometimes we get removed from that. Where, sure, of course, you do because you're running your yeah. business. <clears throat> yeah, and we don't ever, I don't ever get to go camping when I was a campground owner. Like, um, well, now you do, you're old and retired. Yeah, exactly. But uh, back in those days, I, I was a bit removed from that. So it's, really about kind of knowing what your customers want from you and you know what kind of information is valuable to you i really relied on stuff like my front desk staff who own, who was were on the phone answering questions all the time you know what things are folks constantly asking when they when they call we can be showcasing that stuff on the website and saving them that phone call um, or you know shortening the phone call to hey i already have all this great information i just want to book now Right. Yeah. I mean, answer their questions in advance. It's easier for everybody. So, yeah. Um, but, and again, like one, and then that's just the basics, right? Like, and, and sure. we're running out of time. I like, I have got a full schedule. I'm sure you do too. 
we don't want to stay on for too long. But some of the more advanced things that you can do beyond that, right? Like from the basics of adding more websites, but web pages, mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. we were talking about based on what your customers are asking or things of that nature, um, to providing things like local area attraction, to mm -hmm. providing things like um, your event listings. Like we've got a client that we're working with now. We put a super fancy event plugin on their website cool. where their manager can update it. And the guests can RSVP for events in advance. And so it keeps track of that. They can sell tickets, awesome. do whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, and, cool. and it lists all the events in Google search. So you can actually see in wow. the events and it shows up in schema. So if a local person's looking for an Easter egg hunt or something, they're like, oh, cool, this campground does it. Yeah. And you can charge the public for tickets. Like, love it. Um, so things like that, right? I mean, those are the basics. But if you've got a website designer who, wants to charge you two, four, six hundred dollars to add a page to your website, you're like either A, you need to pay them because it's worth it, like in a certain select instances for events and local attractions. Uh, or you need to find somebody who who is more in line with what you want to accomplish. That doesn't mean right. that this person's wrong. Doesn't mean I'm right. There's I'm not saying that. What I mean is is if you want to accomplish providing more services to your guests, and you're being stopped because you don't want to spend two hundred dollars on an extra page, then you need to do it differently. Yeah. You know, yeah. Right? Absolutely agree. No, it's and if that um, means adding the page yourself and figuring out how to do it, okay, do it. Like yeah. Google a training video and WordPress or whatever your website's built in and add your own page. It doesn't have to look perfect or fancy. That's how I learned WordPress was building my campgrounds website. Um, yeah. you know, I mean I didn't build it in the initial form, but yeah, in in order to kind of not have to wait to add information and all of that stuff, I was like, I'm gonna learn this myself, and so I can update my own stuff, um, which was really valuable to me in the end because I'm an impatient human being, <laughs> as I've demonstrated this entire episode. <laughs> but then, just I mean, it's literally just understanding your guest, right? And how do you understand your guest better than knowing more about your guest? So this is the value sure. of an online reservation system like CamSpot or RMS or Astro, all the things, right? right. Uh, is, is because when they book, you collect information about them. Yep. What, where do they live? Um, you know, Whatever questions you're asking at the very basic level, what's their email address, what's their phone number, those kinds of things. It's all data you're collecting that lives in CampSpot that helps yep. you understand that guest better in the future. And if you're adding notes, uh, maybe their interests or what they like or whether they ordered firewood, it's all there. You can do yep. the same thing on your website. The more information you collect about your your visitors and guests, the better. And it's not that it's a creepy thing that they don't know about. It's forms. It's chat. It's tying all those things together. When they fill out a contact form, you can take their name uh, and you can funnel it into a CRM, which is customer relationship management, just like it's a list of people, right? Yeah. That's all it is. Uh, and information about them. But as soon as they fill out a contact form or a rally request form or a barbecue entry form or a online reservation or whatever that is, mm -hmm. you take all that data and you update their record in your CRM. And then you can do all kinds of things with it in the future. You can literally, instead of sending out an email blast with your special to everybody who's ever stayed at your campground, you can then segment it and you can mm -hmm. say, I only want to send that email blast because it's a 10% off deal on cabins to the people who've stayed with me in the last two years who stayed in cabins. Mm -hmm. And then all of a yeah. sudden your open rates are way higher. Mm -hmm. People are opening right. more of your emails because they know when they get your email, it actually is relevant to them. It applies to them. Yeah. Right. It's and, and something so, they're interested in. Yeah. And it's in the future is all about personalization. Like I was looking at for our website, this, you know, insider perks, looking at ways to like, just welcome people by like we did that on oh, we're, oh, we're doing that a couple places um but we yeah. is it a secret by, it, it, for now it is yeah uh, oh um, okay we'll 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 tell later okay but, uh greeting people by name right like if you mm -hmm. know who that person is because it tracks them on a cookie or they filled out a form or made a reservation before uh you put a header on your website that says hey paul welcome back it's nice to see you yeah they're gonna mm -hmm. look their, their mouth's gonna drop open <laughs> They're gonna yeah. be like that. Cool. Well, and it translates back to what we were saying earlier about personalizing that interaction, that experience with them, and and making it less kind of robotic feeling, 
you know, it's not this automated, I mean, it's, it's automated, but <laughs> it feels right. a lot less automated when, it, you know, it's personalized and specifically targets them, targets them is a bad, bad uh, word. It provides, but I, I, It provides value to them is what it really does. It's just absolutely. like, and, and I want to let you finish your thought, but it's just like the ads that follow you around, right? Yeah. Uh, you get annoyed by, you will look at a pair of shoes and the shoes follows you around on CNN and Fox News and wherever else you're going, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you get annoyed by that because you probably already either purchased the shoes or you decided the shoes weren't for you. Yeah, I don't want to buy those. Company, right, but if the marketing or advertising company knows about you and has set up their tracking correctly to show that you already bought the shoes, they're not going to show it to you. Or if they know that you bought the shoes and they know you bought it a year ago, maybe they're going to show it's you time for new shoes. Updated, right, but the yeah. updated line of that specific shoe, like if it's very personalized to you and provides value, you're not going to hate ads. You hate ads because they're irrelevant to you. Right. Yeah. I, and I mean, things like pop pop-ups and things serve them to me, which I don't like. Like I prefer a more strategic, well thought out way to, to deliver those, that information to me. Um, so yeah, that, that personalization I think is incredibly valuable. It establishes a connection with these individuals that you just wouldn't, it's always been the argument against automation and the argument against technology is like making it less personal and and less interactive and stuff. And I think there are some really unique tools coming down the pipeline that, you know, are addressing those specific issues. A lot of them are already here. Like remember what we did, people, I don't even think anybody even commented to me and noticed. Uh, remember what we did for the Canadian conference where we put like at, at the top of every page, because it was a virtual conference, right? It was live from whatever city you were literally in right then when you were looking at the website, geotargeting. Yeah. yeah. So you were in, nobody, nobody commented on that too. Yeah, I got nobody. so many comments on that. How cool oh, was good. it? Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, like, I mean, and even if you were in the States, like live yep. from Detroit, Michigan, live from Dallas, yep. Texas, live from wherever, because it was, it was like it was streaming in your browser in your house. Right. So little yep. things like that. You can say like, we, we can't, you know, I mean, heck, you could even do it dynamically based on location, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're 22 miles away from Sedona, Arizona, or like whatever you're doing, right? Yeah. All of these things are possible. They're hard. They're not easy to implement, but that's why geeks like me exist. And I'm not the only <laughs> person who can do it, right? And, and right. if you've got a marketing background, if you're technologically savvy, or if you, you feel like you can learn it, all of these things can be learned. You can pay for plugins and sure. do all the things that I do. Yeah. Um, but there's value in this. And if you can track the return on investment from it, do it. Eight, turning 1800 bucks into 49K doesn't hurt anybody, for sure. Well, and I'm not saying that everybody gets that return on investment, right? No. Um, no, I'm just using but, your numbers. But even, yeah, but even if, it, even if you spend a dollar to make five, which is absolutely the lowest level we see on that. <laughs> well, um, and I mean, frankly, we're we're dealing with business owners here. They They can always can understand that black and white brass tax bottom line stuff, which I, I really think that's what all of this comes down to is just understanding the connection between, you know, making this effort and, and um, choosing these types of advancements because of their impact to your business performance. And I think oftentimes there's a disconnect between how those are related. No. And so it's it's just literally thinking in your imagination, what can I do, right? I mean, imagine right. like one of the things I'd love to do that I want to try to solve is like made a reservation, follow up, right? So let's say I am a customer. I want to make a reservation through Camp Spot. I'm just picking on Camp Spot, right? Mm -hmm. so I make a reservation through Camp Spot. Then I all of a sudden know that that person, because I've got website tracking, has made a reservation. I can feed that to all my other marketing tools. And then right. I can not only, obviously, Camp Spot's going to send a receipt. But then maybe two days later, I can send a, hey, we're so excited for your upcoming Can't visit. Can't wait to have here's you join you us. And then yeah. seven days after that, you know, if there's enough room, like here's what you should check out or here's a list of store supplies that we have. Somebody mm -hmm. asked me the other day to set up an e-commerce store for their yeah. campground so they could sell T-shirts and stuff online. People will buy that stuff. Put for all sure. your stuff online before they get there. Here's here's yeah. a list of the camping supplies that we have. Do you want to buy firewood? Click here and pay me. Yeah. You want to buy ice? Pay Click here and pay me. It'll be it, on your I'll site. have it waiting when you get here. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are all really unique, cool ways to 
uh, really impact the guest experience, which again, I, fundamentally, in my opinion, a lot of those things were kind of caused because of COVID and, and, you know, this for this requirement to, you know, remote check-in and, you know, pre-order and all these, all these things, which will carry on despite COVID. I think it's, there's tons of convenience. It's incredibly valuable to guests. They're maybe not all guests, but there are definitely a segment of the, the market who are, you know, pri who will prioritize great service like that specifically. Well, everybody so. prioritizes great service. I mean, it's all it's all about value, right? That's all it right. is. You just have to show them value. And so just like you, you can send an email that says, if you know they booked a 30 foot RV site basic without a patio, if you have an open site in camp spot or whatever, send them an email that says you have 24 hours to upgrade at a reduced rate to a patio. And they don't, it might not even be a reduced rate, but you can say it is. Uh, right. And then they click the button and you've got somebody in a patio site and it's easier to fill a basic site because it's cheaper. Yeah, there's all, all kinds of ways to be strategic. I think the biggest barrier for campground owners, and I say this stuff on this show all the time, is just time like the right. the the time it takes to sit in front of a computer and w work through all of this stuff is is monumental when you're also like running a team of staff and making sure all the things get done and mowing grass and <laughs> yeah. whatever else needs to happen that day so i think you know it's another argument obviously for for working with somebody like you who can really take a lot of that stuff off their plates and and also that kind of that I know for me as a campground owner during the season my creativity would get really tapped kind of midway through by July or August I was less motivated to like be super creative and do all kinds of cool stuff because I was tired and wiped out and <laughs> at that point you're just kind of in survival mode and you're working seven days a week and it is what it is um, so using those outside resources keeps that freshness and also brings a different perspective. Like I said, I, you know, I never went camping when I was a campground owner. <laughs> so, you, you have know, now? where's the last place you went camping? <clears throat> uh, oh gosh, it's winter time. So I suppose last summer, well, last fall. Yeah. Here in Alberta, one of our provincial parks went camping. Yeah, you, went to a provincial park. you didn't go to a private campground here? <gasps> For shame. Yeah, I did go to a provincial mm -hmm. park. They're very beautiful. I have visited many, many private parks. Come on. <clears throat> All right. Freedom. We'll let you skate on that one for now. But this, <laughs> this spring in May, when it warms up, May is when it kicks into high season in Canada. When it warms up, uh, we expect you to go to a private park and share your experience. Yeah, sure. I happily will. I uh, will. Uh, well, I'm hoping there's more kind of ease of movement around here provincially. Oh, but yeah, we'll sure. see. yeah. There yeah. Will be. yeah. Time and the fact that most smaller parks do not hire staff and are forced to do everything themselves. I think a good topic in the future is the mental health concerns of owning a park and how to bring in staff no matter how small you are. So we have we have done a, a mental health episode specifically for sure. It's been a while. Uh, I think it was kind of right around this time last year. So, um, and, and you know, I, I, I bring it up a lot because I remember, I vividly remember those years being so rewarding, but also, yeah, they could be incredibly draining. I do think um, being creative about how to have staff support and things like that in your park, even if your park is really small, um, are incredibly valuable just for your own kind of sanity and, and, you know, <clears throat> keeping the business running really efficiently. And, you know, that fresh perspective stuff that we were just talking about, whether you're partnering with a company like Brian's or, you know, you bring somebody in, somebody fun on the front desk or running some events for you or whatever. Um, that's, that's good, fresh and, and, stuff for your guests that are only going to help for sure. Right. And, and just to pull out one of his things, like he's talking about, they don't hire staff and they're forced to do everything themselves. Like I'm very cognizant of the fact that, that a lot of small park owners don't, and I'm going to say it and I'll explain it. Don't think that they have enough budget to work with a 
marketing agency like me, for example, right? Right. Uh, and you don't at the beginning. Like I'm, I'm cognizant of that. Like I started my business in 2009. I wasn't. I didn't take out a bank loan. I had credit cards. I didn't have millions of dollars in venture capital. I bootstrapped the heck out of this thing and mm -hmm. dime to dime, paycheck to paycheck, whatever. Um, yeah. So I'm very cognizant of watching my budgets and all those kinds of things. But if I can, if you, if you can start on, let's just use Google Ads as an example, right? If you can start on Google Ads and give yourself or me or whoever's running your Google Ads, right? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. $10 a day, $300 yep. a month. If you can track it correctly and see that 300 turn into six or nine or 12 or $1,500 mm -hmm. and up it to 350 and up it to 400. Yep. And, and you can use this data all of a sudden now you can see I've had, I had $300 in my bank account. Mm -hmm. Now I've got $1,500 in my bank account based on what I did. Yeah. So now I've got the extra money between three and 1500 an extra 1200 bucks mm -hmm. that I can then reinvest into Google ads. Yep. And then maybe I'm spending $1,500 and mm -hmm. now I'm making 9,000 or 12,000 or whatever. Yeah. Now I've got 10,000 extra dollars. So maybe now I can put more money into Google ads here, but I can also take half of it and hire a staff member to help me around the campground mm -hmm. because I yeah. know I can see in the numbers. I know there's more money in my bank account and where yeah. it's coming from and why it's there. Yeah, no, it's super uh, valuable to realize it's very exponential like that. And I think, uh, you know, Michael's saying there's ways to bring in staff no matter how small you are. I think options like partnering with someone like Insider Perks is is a creative way to alleviate a ton of kind of stuff off of your plate to free you up to do, you know, maybe mow the grass. Well, there's lots of things that do that, right? I mean, we talk about associations, yeah. right? CCRVC. Yeah. You're a member of your association because they provide all kinds of resources and documents and time-saving things and discounts and here's where you go for this so you don't have to Google the heck out of it for 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, it's just time-saving things in general. Yes, marketing is one of those things because it happens to be usually a time suck, right? Uh, right. If you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's one of many things. And so it's Agreed. just literally understanding the value that each of these things brings you. And so you look at hiring staff, for example, right? It's going to cost me a lot of money to hire that staff member. But will it free up your time to allow you to do something else that maybe isn't trackable like Google Ads, right? but that lets you do something that will improve the guest experience that will cause more people to come to your park because they love the landscaping or they love the fact that your pond is clean or there's fish stocked in it now or you've rezoned the slope around it so they can stand and fish on the bank. Like You have to yeah. think about these things in in long term out right it's not all about right now it's taking that risk as a business owner calculated well, educated risk small risk yeah, yeah. understanding where it could lead and it can be tough to have that long term vision specifically in this business i think because and may, maybe you know in lots of parts of the states this doesn't apply but here in canada the season is really short so mm -hmm. You know, you're so there's and there's so many things to do today to get done today. It it's it, it's one of the greatest benefits to kind of using those fall winter months to really make these big strategic decisions and think about you know your five year plan or whatever and and the kinds of things you want to see in your business because from May to September you don't it's harder to <laughs> strategize about those things because you're focused on right now. I have an event tomorrow. I don't have enough staff. You know, I need to mow a hundred sites somehow between now and three days from now. And I'm one body. Like it just, those, those really timely things tend to take over in the busy season. So I really, um, I know for myself, I really used those off months where those stretched, you know, tough days weren't as much of a factor. And I could really focus on long-term planning, like Brian mentioned, you know, the, the adding amenities or strategizing about the kinds of things I wanted to prioritize for myself, the kinds of tasks that, you know, I felt like I needed to do and where I could potentially um, seek support or staffing or whatever else in, in other ways. All right. Well, we could probably talk about this for a while, but yeah, <laughs> a little bit over. So, um, 
Anything else you need to, to say? Like we didn't really cover anything that was happening in the news. There's yeah. there's a headline Friday I saw that Insider Bricks was offering multilingual websites. So there's our news. Wow, that's news. exciting. I I obviously here in Canada that's incredibly valuable. Um, I remember having tons of francophone guests. Um, so you know having my website and and you know service offering and all of that stuff in. Well, we offered service in several languages, but offering French is incredibly valuable here in Canada. So, you know, I think a lot of campgrounds would value a service specifically like that. Um, and then yeah, I guess the only other thing I wanted to mention is um, CCRVC and Purified Systems are doing a uh, webinar on um, Wednesday, on April 13th at 1130 Eastern Standard Time. Um, you can find registration links for that on our Facebook page. We're specifically covering the six best health protection practices for a safe and strong 2021 season. So we'll just kind of work going over with those guys, uh, just strategies and protocols and stuff uh, recommended to open your park kind of strong and, and ready for 2021 in the face of, you know, still still being in the throes of a pandemic, despite all of our best efforts. Um, here we are a year later entering a second season opening this way you know I think a lot of areas in Canada specifically have um, you know pretty specific outlines and guidelines about how they can open and have a good idea about that but uh, Steve and his team at Purified have, have some great suggestions about um, sanitization and keeping things clean and spotless, really instilling confidence from your guests um, that you're making every effort to make sure your property is safe. When is that? How can they register? Just tell them again real quick. Wednesday, April 13th, 1130 Eastern Standard Time. Tomorrow? <clears throat> no, Wednesday. Today's Monday. You said April 13th. Today's April 12th. <gasps> you're right. It is tomorrow. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I'm a day behind. Um, yes, tomorrow, April 13th, April 13th, 1130 Eastern Standard Time. You can register via the Canadian Camping and RV Council's Facebook page. Uh, you should have, as also if you're a member, should have received an email invitation last week. Um, but you can also reach out to me at any time at Kara at campincanada.ca. Um, and I can send registration links your way. Aimless self-promotion. I didn't even give out my email. I should have it on the screen. <laughs> can we do that? Let's, can we put that? All right. No. Uh, we're good, though. Thank you guys for joining us for another episode. I'm, uh, am I sorry or glad that Quiggle didn't show up? I'm sorry Ben Quiggle didn't show up. Let me just me pick too. that one. Uh, no, we miss Ben Quiggle. We really hope uh, he'll be back with us next week. I don't know how. Like, I mean, I guess I didn't come back from my vacation yet, so it's possible that Quiggle never comes back either. Yeah. Um, but hopefully he can figure out how to get better Wi-Fi. Join us next week. Uh, what are we doing next week? Do we know? Or is Quiggle the keeper of that too? We no. We're doing luxury RVs. Um, we have some sounds like some cool kind of manufacturers going over some really neat uh, model layouts and, and things like that. So I'm excited to see that and kind of the new developments, mm -hmm. despite you know back orders and all kinds of problems getting any RVs in anybody's hands these days. Um, these companies are doing some pretty cool, unique, exciting stuff. Awesome. All right. Well, we will see you next week then on Monday. Appreciate you guys joining us again. Remember, we're available on a podcast. If you want to listen to us later, share that kind of stuff. Uh, and we will uh, talk to you soon.